The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with you. Welcome as we gather to worship God here this morning at Park Lake. I invite you to take the red pads that are on the end of the pew and pass those back and forth. Please sign them and leave your name and address or email address. Gives us a chance to drop you a note during the week and let you know we were glad to worship with you. And it's a good practice for everybody to sign. We really want members as well as guests and whomever to sign because we do read these every week. And we try and pay attention uh, regularly to who's here and who's not here so that we can reach out to folks that we haven't seen in a while. So if you don't mind, just make an effort to sign that as it goes by and hand it to someone else you may see coming in later on. So along with that, as we're thinking about greeting each other and passing things back and forth to each other, we again want to encourage you to do whatever you uh, believe is the safest and most careful practice in the time of being concerned about the coronavirus. There's lots of information going out for churches and congregation and other kind of public meetings. And so we encourage you to to adopt some of the practices that you've probably been hearing about, maybe rather than shaking hands during the passing of the peace or going in and out of church, fist bumps, elbow bumps, foot bumps. I heard somebody say something about booty bumps, but I'm not sure I, <laughs> that I can actually encourage that in, in church. But, you know... <clears throat> As the Spirit leads you, uh, you, you, you may uh, show your expressions of uh, gladness to be in one another's presence. We have a uh, luncheon for the ushers um, after the worship service today, actually, actually after the congregational meeting after the worship service, but all ushers and perhaps folks that might like to be ushers, we're having pizza over in Struble Hall as both a sign of our appreciation for all the work you do as ushers, but it also gives us a chance as we sit around the tables for a little bit to review some of the responsibilities and tasks and ideas uh, that we have about serving as ushers. So I encourage you to come over and have a few slices of pizza after the congregational meeting. And we do have a congregational meeting immediately following the worship service, and it shouldn't be too long, so uh, I encourage you to stay for that if you're able. Let us now prepare to worship God in a time of silent preparation.
call to worship is from Psalm 121. Let's read responsively. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our keeper, we thank you that you walk alongside us all our days that you know the ups and downs, the ins and the outs, that you know the hard decisions that we must make and the ones which over which we don't bat an eye. You know us well. We pray as we gather before you in this time of worship that you would sit beside us, that you would whisper to us words that are life-giving, that you would show us a community in which we can grow. We pray your presence with us in this time. In Christ's name, amen. Stand as you are able. Our first New Testament reading is from the Gospel of John, the first part of this. Dan will be reading the second part right prior to the sermon, 
But this is the story of Nicodemus and his visit to Jesus. Listen for God's word. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With these words, we enter and are called to a time of confession. Confession is a place that we bring to God all of those places that we have been living, knowing that our living often takes us further and further away from God. But it is God's greatest desire and passion for us to be drawn to him. So in this time of confession, let us confess our distance and let us hear God's invitation to return. Let's pray together. Holy God, we confess how difficult it is for us to silence the noise of our lives, our need to come to you, to give you our full attention, to turn away from all that distracts and disorients us is very great. But in spite of our need for your healing presence, we give ourselves to insistent demands on our time. We let the loudest voices capture and command our attention. We spend our energy in contentious arguments. We reflect the pridefulness parading around us. And we inwardly absorb the turmoil of the world's fear and mistrust. We ignore your call to us. Come unto me, all you who that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Lord, forgive us for every time, every day, we fail to come to you. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Though we were dead through our sins in great mercy, God has spoken a word of healing and has made us alive together with Christ. Sisters and brothers, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As you are able, you stand and maybe with a fist bump or elbow bump or a wave, will you greet one another with the peace of Christ? Thank you.
Please be seated. I invite the kids who are here to join me on the front steps. So I'm turning to a place in my Bible that I just read a minute ago, and it was about a man whose name was Nicodemus, and he was a leader of the synagogue, which was the Jewish church, where Jesus came from. And he came, and it says, Nicodemus came to see Jesus by night. So that's all I'm going to read to you. Nicodemus came to see Jesus by night. I want you to think about nighttime. What happens at nighttime? The moon rises. The moon rises, it does. What is nighttime? Nighttime is nighttime, right? Mm -hmm. What makes nighttime nighttime? Because there are stars and there is a moon that glows. Yeah, moon that glows, stars in the sky, right? It's what? It's dark at nighttime. It's dark at nighttime. What else happened? Super dark. Not just dark, but super dark. You're right. There's a darkness as we start leaving day and going into night. There's a darkness, but it's super dark at night. What else happens at nighttime, Knox? Do you do do something different? Do you take a shower at nighttime? Yeah. And do you put your pajamas on at nighttime? Yeah, and then you go to, sleep. go to sleep. But this man, whose name was Nicodemus, who worked at the temple church, at nighttime, he came to see Jesus. When everything is shutting down, when it's dark, what do you think is going on? Do you think he was... Where was the light? Where was the light? In his house. Oh, maybe there was a light in Jesus' house? Yeah? He was sneaking around is what he was doing. Do people do that at nighttime? No. Well, actually, they do. They sneak around at nighttime because you can't see them as well. And so Nicodemus had some friends that he knew would not like if he went to see Jesus. So he needed to go at night. And he came to Jesus because Jesus was light. He probably had light in his house. But Nicodemus knew that Jesus had another kind of light. What other kind of light could that be? Candle. Could have had a candle. I'll bet he did. I'll bet it was an oil lamp. What other kind of light did he have? A flashlight. Could have had a flashlight. Well, not, not then. They didn't have flashlights all the way back. But they did have a candle or oil lamp. He had light that came from God. It was light that reminded Nicodemus is, I don't have to sneak around because God is my light. So sometimes at, when it's dark, it scares us, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, darkness can be scary. And sometimes we do what? We turn on a nightlight? A nightlight? Do you, anybody have a nightlight in their room? Because sometimes... Have night you have a nightlight in your room. Because when you wake up and it's in the darkness, you know that darkness doesn't feel good. Nicodemus came to see Jesus in the darkness, but he wanted light. And that's our story for today, is that God calls us out of the darkness into light. So I have light for everybody. And this says, Jesus is my light. I'm going to give everybody a light. Can you pass that? Chenley, can you come? Can you, let's pass it around, if you're here, there you go, one, it says, Jesus is my light, I want you to turn it on, and if you can't turn it on, check underneath and see if there's a piece of paper sticking out, is there, <gasps> Knox got it, pull the paper out, and give me the paper, All right, and try turning it on, did it turn on? It does, yay! Does yours turn out? Did you put? Are we, are we gonna 
Let's be push. Shenley, you're right. Here, try that one. Let's put it on the cross. Yes, let's do. If you want to put it on the cross, it's stuck, and we'll get that to work. Good. Good. You got it. Oh, good. Good noticing. All right. And if you want, here, Shenley, drop it in there. Thank you, Knox. You can put your light at the foot of the cross, and then after church, go grab that light, okay? Can you remember to do that? And then you can keep it after church. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I'm okay with that right now. I'm okay. Come back here and let's have a prayer together. And we'll remember that Jesus is our light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. Let's pray. Dear God, sometimes we are in the dark, but we want light. Help us to come to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. If you want to go to children's time. I'm thinking that maybe next week we can add some flashing lights and color to that as well. I have some Christmas lights still that haven't been put away that I can bring in for children's sermons. So We continue the reading from the Gospel of John in chapter 3, the story of Jesus's, uh, Nicodemus' visit to Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, give us your light. Shine your love and your grace into our lives. Pour out your spirit so that in these words of scripture we read and hear today, We may know and experience the wonder of your presence and be renewed by your love for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You've probably seen different lists of answers that people give to questions uh, that are posed to them, questions like this one. If you could have a conversation with any person in history, living or dead, who would that person be? You've probably at one time or another seen the answers compiled in the different kinds of lists. And I was wondering 
about some of those answers and some of those uh, lists. And so, of course, I Googled it to see if anybody had ranked in one comprehensive list all the answers ever given to a question like this. And what I found out is there are tons of different lists. There doesn't seem to be one list that has all the answers that's authoritative for everybody. And since there are lots of different lists, there are lots of different answers. So I got to thinking about it. It made me think that I guess the ranking that you might come up with depends on the people that you're asking the question of, right? It has a lot to do with the sample. And so I'm not really sure how then you can go about sorting out all the different groups of people that had been asked according to the answers they have been given. I know that sounds more complicated than it probably needs to be, but listen to some of the list and the answers given, and maybe that'll help you try and get a hand on what I'm talking about. One of the lists that I came across, the question of who would you like to have a conversation with, living or dead in history, one of the lists came up with these top three answers. Number one, Elvis Presley. Number two, Marilyn Monroe. Number three, George Washington. Now that would make a really interesting dinner party, wouldn't it? To get Elvis and Marilyn and George together. And I'm not sure how those three came together all at once. So then you can search a little bit more. And I, and I found another list. And these were the top three on this list. Number one, Jesus Christ. Number two, Leonardo da Vinci. Number three, Plato. Now, Elvis didn't even make the second list, <laughs> but Marilyn Monroe did come in at number 63, one spot ahead of Mother Teresa at number 64. <laughs> you know, so maybe a, a better question for us to ponder and think about is, which uh, group of people giving answers would you prefer to hang out with? Uh, the people in the first list? Or the, and then I got to thinking, you know, it might be kind of interesting if we did these samples according to denominational backgrounds, because I'm sure we have ideas about what we as Presbyterians uh, would answer. You know, we, we would see Presbyterians' top list would be Jesus Christ, uh, Einstein, Aristotle, right? And wouldn't we be humbled if the list came back something like uh, Lady Gaga, or Harry Styles or, or whomever you can think of that just would not come to mind right away. I imagine that most of us, if we were asked that question, who would you like to have a conversation with? We would answer, wouldn't you? We would answer Jesus, number one. Or at least you would think that's the answer that you are supposed to give, right? Or at least you might put Jesus in your top three. That gives you a little room for an interesting dinner party to get two other people together with Jesus for conversation. Is that, is that true of you as you're thinking about it? Who would you like to have a conversation with? Would you like to have a conversation with Jesus? What would you ask him? In the Gospel of John, there are a series of people who engage Jesus in extended conversations. And you might remember some of them. There's the woman who meets Jesus at the well at noon. This is there. And who banters back and forth with Jesus until he starts to ask questions about areas of her life that a stranger wouldn't know. And then she begins to back away somewhat from the conversation. There's also the extended conversation of the blind man who's healed by Jesus and as a result gets hostily interrogated by religious leaders and neighbors. And so it becomes an extended conversation first between the blind man and Jesus and then between the blind man and the religious leaders and neighbors and his parents. And then finally the conversation comes back to the blind man and Jesus again. And this time, though, it's Jesus questioning the blind man. Then there is the conversation between Mar Martha and Jesus, the sisters Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. This is a conversation between Martha and Jesus when Jesus arrives at Bethany shortly after Lazarus has died. And in her grief, Martha pleads with Jesus to do something to help her brother. And in that conversation, Jesus questions Martha about what she thinks can really be done. 
and who she believes he is. You see, in John's gospel, these and other conversations with Jesus seem to be John's way of unwrapping the mystery of Jesus' identity as the story of Jesus' life progresses. And as we listen to these conversations in John's gospel, and we hear the questions that arise, and we hear the expressions of faith that are given by the people who are talking to Jesus, these conversations push us to begin to think about our own questions and, and sort of pull us to begin to form our own answers about who Jesus is and what we might ask and what we might say and what we might think if, if we found ourselves engaged in a conversation with Jesus. But the first of these conversations that we come across in John's gospel is, of course, this conversation between Jesus and a Jewish religious leader, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And it's probably the conversation with Jesus in John's gospel that you remember the best. It may be the one conversation that sticks out in your head. And it's easy to remember. It'll probably be easy for the children to remember as Helen talked to them about it because Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He comes to see Jesus under the cloak of darkness, which automatically begins to add suspense to the situation and, and build some mystery in the conversation which will take place. And, and it begins to make us wonder and make us question the, the inner conflict that may be going on in Nicodemus himself as he, as he comes to Jesus. Is Nicodemus a prominent Jewish religious leader? Is Nicodemus afraid to be seen with Jesus? He must have felt even at this early stage, remember it's only the third chapter of John, he must have felt like there was some risk involved. Otherwise, why would he come in the middle of the night? What is it about Jesus that makes Nicodemus interested? And is he genuinely interested in Jesus? Or is he just trying to explore ideas about Jesus? Is he sympathetic to some of the things that Jesus has said and done already? Is he searching for something himself, for some kind of answer, for some kind of insight that he's never been able to find anywhere else? Immediately we're, we're drawn in, perhaps even into the, to the dynamic, to the turmoil, perhaps even to the conflict within Nicodemus himself as he comes to talk to Jesus at night. But when you begin to hear it again, you realize it's a very awkward conversation. This conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, it starts off very formal and very stiff. It's not, oh, hey, Jesus, it's good to see you again. Nothing, nothing easy. How's it going? What's been going on with you? No light banter. Nicodemus immediately addresses Jesus formally. Rabbi. In fact, he doesn't even ask Jesus a question. He starts by making a statement. He makes a declaration, a pronouncement of what he says he already knows about Jesus. Rabbi, certainly you are a teacher from God. Only someone from God can do the signs that you've done. How do you imagine that Jesus would, would answer that kind of declaration, the kind of statement right off the beginning. I think a balanced and reasonable response might have been perhaps to acknowledge and confirm Nicodemus's statement. Thank you, Nicodemus. Thank you for that compliment. You're, you're exactly right. You're as smart as everybody says you are. But that's not what Jesus says at all. Instead, Jesus meets Nicodemus' statement with a declaration of his own. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Or you may have a different translation that says without being born 
anew or without being born a second time. The, the Greek there is a word that has layers of meaning and can be drawn in both a temporal direction or a spatial direction. No one can be born a second time or no one can be born from above. Then the conversation right after this starts to take a series of twists and turns that push and challenge Nicodemus's declared certainties with these new truths that Jesus continues to confront him with. Nicodemus says to Jesus, there's only one way to be born. Everybody knows that. And Jesus said, no, there's a new birth and a new life that comes from the spirit. And Nicodemus says, that's not anything I've ever been taught. That's not anything I've ever taught anybody. And then Jesus challenges Nicodemus, if you're a teacher, how can you be a teacher if you don't know this, if you've never taught this? And then at this point, the conversation really becomes one-sided with Jesus doing all of the talking. Nicodemus, what I'm telling you is first-hand knowledge of mine. But you don't believe it since you really don't believe in me. Nicodemus, if you don't believe me, how can you have any idea, any understanding of what I'm telling you. Nicodemus, only someone who has direct experience of this can tell you about it. Nicodemus, God's love, which you see in me, is the source of life for the world. Nicodemus, if you believe in me, you'll experience what I experience. Nicodemus, God sent me to bring life to the world not to take life from the world. Nicodemus, if you don't believe in me, you don't believe in the life God sent me to bring. Nicodemus, some people choose darkness instead of light. Some people choose the ways of death instead of the ways of life. Nicodemus, the way of life is revealed in God's love. The love of God that you see in me. Nicodemus, if you choose the way of God's love, my life will clearly be seen in you. And, and then the conversation ends. And it ends abruptly. As we're reading along, we wouldn't even know the conversation ends except that the, the next chapter opens up and Jesus has gone on to meet the woman at the well. But this conversation with, with Jesus and Nicodemus just sort of lingers there in the air without a clear ending, without closure. Jesus doesn't say to Nicodemus, now Nicodemus, that's all I'm going to say to you, so go chew on this for a while. Think about it. And when you come up with a good response, you're welcome to come back and visit me anytime. And we don't see Nicodemus, we don't see him sneak back out into the night, walking down the street, or maybe we don't see him sneaking out as dawn's breaking if the conversation with Jesus lasted all night long. We, we don't really know. It's such a peculiar end to this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. It's sort of open-ended. It's, it's almost as though they could still be talking. They could still be engaged in conversation. I wonder, though, what part of the conversation did, Jesus, did Nicodemus walk away remembering? What was it that really stuck in his mind as he started to walk back down the street, either in the dark or maybe in the beginning of the light of day? Do you think he remembered? John 3.16 that's going to fit really well on a poster or a bumper sticker. I'm going to write that one down. It's going to be big. 
What part of that conversation do you think really stuck in Nicodemus' mind? Maybe it was that part about, Nicodemus, you must be born again, because that's the part that really seemed to puzzle him. How in, how in the world could anyone be born a second time? Do you have to crawl back into your mother's womb? Maybe, maybe that's what sort of was something he was struggling with. Or maybe it was that part about uh, Jesus saying, uh, the Son of Man will be lifted up just like Moses lifted up the emblem of the snake in the, in the wilderness in the Exodus story, because that's just odd. And we have to go back and research the Old Testament and make the connections and learn again the references that Jesus is talking about when he uses that image. Or maybe what really stuck with Nicodemus was the things that Jesus said at the end about about the judgment. The judgment that some people have already brought on themselves. The hard choices that people make. Maybe it's, it's that one that he remembered because that would have been really challenging. What would you ask Jesus if you went to see him in the middle of the night when no one else was looking? What's really on your heart that you'd want to know or that you'd want to ask? Think about that conversation that that might take place. And, And ask yourself if what happened to Nicodemus might happen to you in your conversation with Jesus, would the religious certainties that, that you might start with, would they suddenly be challenged by Jesus and sort of turned upside down on their head? Would you go to Jesus in the middle of the night and start off by saying, Jesus, now I know that you pretty much are in agreement with everything that I already think. <laughs> and that I know it's okay for, for me to use you and things you've said to support all the things that I'd like to see happen in the world. Is that the way you would, you would begin? And, and what would happen if Jesus said, no, you've got some new things to learn here. You've got to start to look at things in an entirely different way because I'm not at all comfortable with being associated with some of the things you're doing. What would happen if your conversation with Jesus went that way? Or what would happen if your conversation with Jesus went like this, Jesus, I have been a dedicated disciple and follower of you all my life, but something just seems to be missing right now. And Jesus said to you, you know, you need to be born again. There needs to be a new movement of life and spirit at work in you. Can you be open to that? Can you live into that? Are you willing to risk that kind of change? What would you do if your conversation with Jesus went that way? Or what would you do if your conversation with Jesus went this way? You need to start to look to see the love of God in my life in ways that you've never seen before. Maybe you could look to the refugees in Africa and see the people who are going there and and building preschools and refugee camps like we heard Keith Ritchie talk about a few weeks ago. Maybe you need to start to look for my love there. Or maybe you need to go to Grace Medical Home and volunteer there and begin to look and see my love at work in the midst of those nurses and physicians who are caring for undocumented workers because they can't get health care anywhere else. Maybe you need to start to look for my love there. Or maybe you, you need to start to look for my love in the people who are diametrically opposed to each other but willing to risk having an honest, open conversation to see where Christ's love can bring them together again. What would happen if your conversation with Jesus went that way? What would happen if your conversation with Jesus took this turn? Look again at the choices you've made in your life because sometimes we choose the darkness over light because we're afraid for our deeds to come to light. 
Look again at what you see going on in the world around you because sometimes people choose darkness over light because the evil seeks the darkness. Love comes to light. Look again and be willing to be judged. What would happen if your conversation with Jesus went that way? Nicodemus shows up two more times in John's gospel. Some of you probably know that. So it's interesting to see where he comes back into the story. He comes back into the story, I think, in the seventh chapter, when the religious leaders hostile to Jesus are having a trial and beginning to trump up charges, false charges. They're going to bring against Jesus in order to arrest him. And, and in the midst of that crowd, as the, the anxiety is building, Nicodemus sort of hesitantly comes forward and, and raises the objection, the question, is it, is it really right to accuse someone without their even having a chance to defend themselves, to say something? He just poses the question, but very quickly the others silence him and move forward in their decisions to arrest Jesus and seek his death. But maybe he made a little effort there. And then we see Nicodemus again at the end of John's gospel with Joseph of Arimathea going to get Jesus' body. And Nicodemus bringing just an incredible amount of perfume and spices from his own resources to bury Jesus with. It makes you wonder the conversation that's been going on in Nicodemus' head ever since he, he came to Jesus in the middle of the night. Maybe it encourages you or challenges you to enter in the conversation with Jesus again, now, day, night, whenever, and hear what he has to say. Amen. Let us stand and affirm what we believe by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. Will you pray with me? Great God, we give you thanks for those invitations that you have given to us to have a conversation with you, with Jesus, for that unwrapping of the mystery of who you are and, and who we are. We are mindful from, mindful from this story that there are places that we live in darkness in our lives, Darknesses of fear and loss, of pain and disappointments, darknesses of our sickness, of indecisions. And yet you whisper to us to come and join you in the light, for in you is love and life and hope and purpose 
and wholeness and confidence which is only born in relationship with you. We pray that as we stand in this in-between of our living, that your voice might be that one that we hear and that we might turn to you in the season of Lent, even as you head towards the cross, that we might understand this gift of salvation that is ours to live in and to have confidence in, to be freed from the things that are weighing us down. We lift up to you in our hearts and our minds those that we are worried about, those who who fill our our anxiousness day in and day out. We lift up to you our families and our friends and those that struggle that are half a world away. We pray for our leadership, for confidence and wisdom and, and guiding out of a sense of love and community. We pray for strength and that you would raise up within us a strength where it is obvious that we have been in communion with you. Guide us as we go into a new week. We pray health. We pray for wisdom to come for dealing with this virus. We pray for strength and healing for those who are already experiencing it. Guide us so that we might serve you best Hear us as we lift up that prayer which come from Jesus' own words, and we pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our worship continues with the presentation of our tithes and our offerings.
then if you're able, I encourage you to stay for just a few minutes for the congregational meeting immediately following the benediction. And then you're welcome to come get some pizza. Whether you're an usher or not, there'll probably be enough pizza for lots of folks. So ushers, please stay. And now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide and keep us all now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. The purpose of this congregational meeting is a yearly requirement by our um, polity, our book of order, and today it is to approve our 2020 trustees and our 2020 congregational nominating committee, and also to approve your pastor's terms of call, i.e. their salary. So um, that's required to be done every year. I will um, lead you in the approval of trustees and nominating committee and am inviting Kimo Hyatt to um, lead you in the terms of call. For the trustees, if you're here and you're able, would you stand as I call your name? Jim Bogner, Nancy Jones, Norma Knight, Dick Butler, and Kelsey Francis. These five have been nominated for, um, by the session for you to approve as trustees for this year. Are there nominations from the floor? Can we have a motion to approve? Is there a second? Thank you. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. The 2020 Congregational Nominating Committee is Lisa Bainbridge, Linda Shreves, John Rachey, Jane Callahan, John DeSalvo, Ann Vercheski, and with her permission, Jan Ellis. Jan, okay. You haven't walked out the door, so. Are there other nominations from the floor? This is... We are approving the nominating committee who will nominate any officers that we need to, um, to slots that we need to fill for this year or the next. Other nominations from the floor? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. And uh, Kimo Hyatt. Good morning. It's my pleasure to put forth from the Finance Committee uh, the motion that we extend the calls of Helen and Dan Devon Boyce for 2020. The specificity of the call has been published, but in its most essence of sense, we are giving them a 3% raise. Do I hear a motion to move forward? No? What? Yes? I call for the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Motion carries. We conclude the meeting. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, okay. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Any opposed? He didn't ask that. Okay. Okay. That was good. Okay. Yeah. Let's close with prayer. Thank you. Great God, we thank you for the work that you have given us to do and for leaders to, to do that work. We thank you that you um, do not leave us alone, but that your spirit guides us and pushes us and pulls us to, to uh, follow and to, um, to uh, be loving and gracious in our following. Guide us into this week and um, may your spirit be there and, um, and speak to our living. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.